Hello, and thank you for tuning in to CB8 Speaks. I'm Ellen Pallavi. I'm a member of Community Board 8, and I'm here today with Sally Menard. And Sally Menard is going to be talking about Four Freedoms Park on Roosevelt Island. Sally Menard is currently vice chair of the Four Freedoms Park Conservancy. During the preceding 10 years, Sally was president CEO of the Franklin D. Roosevelt Four Freedoms Park that built the Presidential Memorial and president CEO of the Conservancy Incorporated to operate and maintain the new civic space. In 2012, Roosevelt Island got a new park. It was one that had been in the works for 40 years, and it honors President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, after which the island was named. The long process of creating this park is a testament to the value of patience, vision, and persistence, and to the difficulty of getting any large project done in New York, where competing interests abound. Today, I'm thrilled to talk with Sally about the building of the park, what it means to the community, what it means to the United States. And Sally is a most valuable player. She pulled this stalled project from the back burner, where it had, it had been kept simmering by the visionary ambassador, William Vanden Heuvel. And she and Ambassador Vanden Heuvel made this vision a reality, finally, after 40 years. So, Sally, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Ellen. It's a pleasure. It's great. Um, what drove Ambassador Van den Heuvel to have this vision of this memorial? Well, Ambassador Van den Heuvel, who's a, a wonderful public servant uh, on the federal level, the state level, and the city level, uh, he's been enamored of FDR since he was a child. When he was 12 years old, he talked himself into attending FDR's funeral at Hyde Park, having hitchhiked there from his home in Rochester. So he's, uh, throughout his whole career, he's a lawyer, but he's also had this tremendous interest in FDR as an example of real leadership and real vision for the country. And uh, he helped, he got uh, President Reagan to agree to support the memorial to FDR in Washington. Uh, he also built the visitor center up at Hyde Park near the library. Uh, and so he always felt that there should be a memorial to FDR in his home state. After all, he was a senator, he was a governor, and he was a president, and there was no memorial to him. So that was his driving force throughout a long period of time. And he also saw the possibility of it being a platform for education for new generations of school kids who might not be exposed to civics and other American history that would be helpful to them. Well, how did he name it, Four Freedoms, and what did he envision? Well, we spent that? a lot of time thinking about that. For the first 35 years, it was referred to as the Roosevelt Memorial. Um, and, of course, it, it is built to honor the man, but also to draw attention to and, and make visible the, the Four Freedoms themselves, which turn out to be really the basis of our domestic policy, even the basis of our foreign policy since World War II. So we always knew people would know it was a presidential memorial, but to, to honor and, uh, and, and promulgate the Four Freedoms seemed like a very valuable uh, mission. And calling it a park, because we wanted people to use it like a park as well. So why don't we listen to FDR himself telling us about in his speech, telling us about his vision of the four freedoms. Never gets old. It never gets <laughs> old. The first is freedom of speech and expression everywhere in the world. The second is freedom of every person to worship God in his own way everywhere in the world. The third is freedom from want, which translated into world terms means economic understandings which will secure to every nation a healthy peacetime life for its inhabitants everywhere in the world. The fourth is freedom from fear, which translated into world terms means a worldwide reduction of armaments 
to such a point and in such a thorough fashion that no nation will be in a position to commit an act of physical aggression against any neighbor anywhere in the world. This nation has placed its destiny in the hands and heads and hearts of its millions of free men and women, and its faith in freedom under the guidance of God. Freedom means the supremacy of human rights everywhere. Our support goes to those who struggle to gain those rights and keep them. Our strength is our unity of purpose to that high concept there can be no end save victory. I tear up when I, when I think about Four Freedoms because it just makes so much sense, and I wish we would do that today. I wish that could be our mission today. Well, in the engraving on the, uh, of the speech, in the room, as Khan called it, it talks about uh, a goal that's achievable in our own time and generation. And, of course, we didn't get there. But one reason to focus on the speech and the four freedoms is to encourage and motivate people to continue to commit themselves to trying to achieve them. Roosevelt did this, and it spoke it at a time when people were suffering very badly. There was depression, there was war, and those four freedoms spoke to them. Yeah, what was so exciting? It, you know, people will think of it as being associated with our entry into the war, but he actually delivered that speech to Congress 11 months before Pearl Harbor. But the country was very isolationist at the time. And Roosevelt knew enough about what was going on under Nazi Germany and fascist Italy. Um, and so his speech was really to Congress, to the population, but to the world. And what he was saying is this, uh, this threat to civilization as we know it is very great, and it's probable that we'll be involved in it at some point in time. And the only thing that will justify that sacrifice that we'll be called upon to make is if we're working for a world in which everyone everywhere in the world enjoys those four freedoms. That's something to strive for. Definitely. I definitely so, hope forever. we strive for that. And we'll come back to that a little bit later in our, in our discussion. I'd like, to, like you to tell us a little bit about the, the visitors, and what the park does now that it's open. And it's, it's such a pretty park. I know a lot of it's been, it's been a bit of contention, this park, since it took 40 years. And part of that time, it was an, it was an empty space. And so people could make it whatever they wanted. And the Roosevelt Islanders became quite proprietary about the space. So when it became a created space, they no longer could use their imagination. People got upset about, oh, it's too formal. But it's really quite nice. And would you tell, tell us how, how, how people use the space, what, what goes on there? Well, you already referenced in your introduction, it's very hard to do something big and important in a little town or a big city, um, you know, without some vocal opposition. Um, but this was a project that was grandfathered. Uh, there was no guarantee it was going to happen. I think one of the reasons we were able to move forward is no one thought it ever would happen, having not happened for 35 years. But basically what's created here is almost a sculpture in the landscape. Louis Kahn, who's an iconic architect of the 20th century, was chosen by Rockefeller when Rockefeller and Lindsay renamed the island for Roosevelt and dedicated these four acres. Uh, but from the very beginning, in addition to being an educational platform, obviously we wanted to make those four acres something that residents, New Yorkers and visitors from around the country, around the world, would enjoy. So we have a very vibrant programming schedule each year between April and October, which is our longer day season. Um, so. I mean, we have kite building and kite flying in conjunction with the UN Peace Day. We offer yoga taught by three Roosevelt Island residents. We have Imagination Playground, which is a wonderful set of gigantic blue styrofoam blocks that kids love to play with all over the lawn if they can get them away from their parents. And things like the Uni Project, which is a portable library. 
that we open up on a weekend and people of all ages love it. We have musical evenings in the summertime where we teach people certain dances and then have them enjoy the music. We've really tried to develop a place that people will come to and enjoy for all kinds of reasons. I've been to many of your events there. It's Good. a lot of fun. Um, in fact, I'm in one of your pictures. Oh, I bet you are. <laughs> one of the pictures that's on the screen. Well, you're pretty central to Roosevelt <laughs> Island, so that's not surprising. How many people come to the park every year? Yeah, we've had about 150,000 each year. We're approaching 650,000 total. And we, we did a, a survey of visitors and found that approximately 62% come from the United States, from 26 states, and then the other you know, 40 come from uh, outside the United States, and so far 46 countries are represented by our visitors. So it's an economic driver for the city, which is just kind of a side benefit. It's not why we built it, but it's, it's a nice thing to be true. Um, we know that they come frequently. About a third of them come um, once a week or more. So the locals are using it to a large extent. And then yes. it's not the kind of destination you just happen upon, which is true of a lot of wonderful sites inside the city. You have to make a conscious effort to get there. It's at the southern tip of an island that's uh, you know reachable by tram, which is part of the adventure. So we have a very satisfied user base, but we're always looking for new ideas and new ways to make it attractive to them. You know, we also celebrate uh, patriotic holidays, 4th of July, Memorial Day. Memorial Day, we, we uh, invite veterans to participate. We lay a wreath in front of the bust of uh, FDR, and it can, it's very somber and sober, and we give out little flags, and it, it's fun. Um, we also hosted the United Nations Human Rights Day in December, which makes a lot of sense, too. We also hosted a naturalization ceremony, which was very poignant. You know, there were 32 people from 28 countries who took the oath of citizenship right there at Four Freedoms Park in front of FDR. That's a great way of using the park. It's lovely. It, it really is. I mean, you, you hosted Hillary Clinton's Yes, she, she worked with us to do her formal uh, campaign launch in June of 2015. That was a nerve-wracking day. And it was amazing how many people it held. Well, we had a limit. Uh, we couldn't have more than 7,500. The amount of, the number of people you can have in a state park is determined by a formula that has to do with the uh, linear dimensions of your egress in case there had to be an evacuation. So we had to cut it off uh, at 7,500. But it was a beautiful day. Everybody was in such good spirits. They started lining up at 6 o'clock in the morning, and it just went off beautifully. So it was a happy time. There's another story about this park, and that is about Louis Kahn. Yes. And how, how was he chosen? He was a, a premier architect. How was he chosen? among all the other architects of, that were possible. You know, we'd have to go back and have a conversation with Governor Nelson Rockefeller, because there was no competition. He chose Louis Kahn, who was one of the most famous architects. Little known, he's, he's been described as, uh, like, the designated hitter. He didn't build that many buildings. He didn't come up to bat that often. But every time he did, it was a home run. So every building that he's done, from the Salk Institute in California to the uh, Parliament Building in Bangladesh, they're, they're just monumental in a, in a modern way that harkens back to Greco-Roman architecture. And so he really created a sculpture in the landscape. And when you're there and experience it in person, it's a little bit like being on the, the prow of a ship. And as the New York Times wrote when we were trying to get going, um, you know, time to build it now, facing the sea that, uh, that Roosevelt loved, the Europe that he helped to save, the UN that he inspired. And it is a little bit like being on a ship, sitting there in the middle of the East River, across from the UN. It, it definitely feels that way. I, I know you have a lot of programming that focuses on just having fun, but how do you tell the story of FDR in your programming? Well, I'm glad you asked that. Uh, we do have guided tours by volunteers who are very well trained in the history, and uh, on weekends they're free guided tours, and then. We have a very, I think, a very rich educational program. We've had thousands of school kids who come with their classes for, for field trips, and some were art workshop-based, but now we have curriculum that's based on the Four Freedoms, and we use the city as the classroom because one of the, uh, one of the curricula is based on freedom from want, and you can talk about public housing, and you can talk about hospitals. Um, so all of the curriculum that we've developed is based on Common Core standards, because teachers are pressed enough. You can't, you can't get them excited to do something that they don't actually have to do or that doesn't help them meet their 
uh, requirements for teaching. So we have curriculum that's based for uh, second grade through 12th grade. And it's just so exciting to us to have the kids come. Our, one of our main objectives is help them understand how the four freedoms are very relevant to their lives today. So when you talk about freedom from fear, they make the connection with stop and frisk or bullying or you talk about freedom from want. They think about the kid in their class who doesn't have money for lunch uh, or even the homeless kids. So it's, it's been very satisfying to see how quickly the young people understand the concept and understand why it's relevant to them. Do you have any of that for the general public? Yes, absolutely. I mean, we do have the guided tours uh, for young weekends. Uh, everything's free at the park, actually, except unless you want to buy a soda. Um, <laughs> but uh, we also created something that's a web-based history of the whole Roosevelt era, uh, divided into four parts. Um, and we use archival footage, photos, narrative, and we've written, basically, a total history. And it's accessible on the internet anytime, any, anywhere. So teachers can look at it before they come to the park and begin to think about what they want their kids to take away, and vice versa. Find Our website, uh, fdr4freedomspark.org, uh, is very full of all of the information that I'm telling you right now. It has a link immediately to what we're calling the digital resource. And it's a very rich, scholarly, new treatment of Roosevelt's whole era. So from the, from the simplest version to the more complicated, scholars can use it and or second graders can go visit it as well. That's great. That we, we, we had a, a new uh, monument on Roosevelt Island right nearby called the Hope Memorial, which Four Freedoms played a part in, in sponsoring. Uh, we showing, did. showing, and we thank you so much for that. That uh, that that actually moved us forward to to almost be able to get it to get the project started. Yeah, we were thrilled, and it, it, was, it seems to have uh, prompted an, an anonymous donor to uh, to help. We 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 gave a hundred thousand at the beginning, and then we also helped uh, the committee uh, secure one hundred fifty thousand from the city. But because the city money is only available. Uh, as reimbursement, right. they had to raise another <laughs> that was set a of funds. Yeah, that but they've was, done that it, was and it's challenge. exciting. That we were was... more than happy to do that. You know, our only mandate way back in <laughs> ten years ago was to build exactly what Lewis Kahn designed. So we understand, we understood the urge of the disability community on Roosevelt Island, which is so big and so important to have a depiction of Roosevelt and his disability. And so that's why we were very happy to support the creation of a sculpture that's hopefully well underway at this so point. So we hope to have it be finished by the spring. Oh, excellent. It's that's in, just great. Right. It's, and you pass it on the way to Four Freedoms Park, and we're just delighted. That will be a picture of FDR in his wheelchair. Mm -hmm. Reaching out to a young girl on crutches. It's that's a lovely right. statue. That's right. It's very beautiful. And, and that, I feel, actually rounded out the story, the story. of FDR. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. there will be two places where people could find stories about yes. him. And I'm I'm hoping that his story will will really be will be shown more often these days because we need it. We desperately need that story very, to be very, told. Very very relevant, and that, that's yes. why our education is really aimed at trying to create uh, more motivated and better informed citizens. I mean, when we talk to the students about the legacy of FDR and the commitment to social in, social justice and uh, civic engagement. That's the objective, is to help them all understand the value of this democracy and their part in it. I'd like to spend some time talking about the, the effort that, you, that, that went on to get this to happen. You know, I know, I know the, construction, the, the construction took a bit of time and was very precise, and Gina Palera had the, uh, the, uh, the architect who was the, she was the executive, she was executive director, director of the LLC that we formed to actually build the park. And she was all over the place, just like you were. She was all over the place networking with the community, getting mm -hmm. people to, to buy into the concept of it, and out there in the community on the board of the Hope Memorial where, you know, helping she us a choose, yes. helping us choose a, 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 the sculptor, a sculptor. herself. Mm -hmm. and, she really helped a lot, and to hear her describe the precision of 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 the of the materials and the 
and the creation of it and the, the, the building of it and how every angle had to be exact. And, and Louis Kahn's design had to be very precise and, and, and angular. Um, it was, it was really interesting. And then she talked about the, the room, mm -hmm. the room, and I've experienced it. There's the, you walk down a, a long path and there's a, uh, with a green, a green grassy slope with granite on either side. Mm -hmm. And then you get to the bust of FDR, yes. which is just like a little head. Just a little head a floating a there, <laughs> floating a there feet. in a little box. <laughs> and then behind the head is a, is the room is the room. And Roosevelt Islanders used to experience what used to be there is this wide open space where you could see everywhere all at once. You just turn around and you could see the whole 360 degree view. Now the view is boxed in, even though it's supposed to be a meditative room, it's boxed in. And some visitor described it to me as you walk into, it's the metaphor for what was going on at the time when Roosevelt had his Four Freedom speech. You know, there was the Great Depression, people were feeling boxed in, they were depressed, there was, it was a misery, you're in this box. And then there's hope at the end because the view opens up and there's the UN. And it gives me chills just thinking about it. The, you know, you walk into this depressed place, you meditate in this, in this enclosed environment, um, which is open to the sky, I'll grant you that, but it is pretty enclosed and you cannot see 360 degrees anymore, but you can see out and you can see hope and you can see the UN and it's quite remarkable. I think it's a brilliant reveal actually. I mean, yes. if you've sauntered down one of the alleys under the 120 little leaf linden trees with a complete view of Manhattan, and Queens on the other side, and then you get to the bust, which is kind of the focal point of the uh, of the memorial, and then you get into the room. and I don't think Khan thought of it as a box. Uh, he called it a room because uh, his whole concept was a garden and a room. So the lawn and the alleys of trees are the garden part, and then the room is actually a 60-foot square open-air plaza, and then there's this giant reveal. He thought of it as a place for reflection look at the speech, think about it, hopefully be inspired to commit yourself to help us realize those four freedoms around the world. And then you saunter to the end, and the, uh, the hidden fence, or the sunken fence, is a device that enables you to see that total reveal with no barriers or walls in front of you, because the height of that lower, of that end wall is even with the floor of the room, and that's what gives you this marvelous reveal. But and coming back to the columns that create the room, they are placed one inch apart. And that was designed specifically because Khan said uh, the walls parted and the columns appeared. He uh, identified the introduction of columns into architecture as a major advancement. Before that, walls had to be solid. But with the invention of the column, they didn't have to be solid anymore. Obviously, the Acropolis and a few other places have more than one inch in between their columns. But that mm -hmm. was his concept. And uh, the columns themselves, there are 28 of them. They're 36 tons each. They're 12 feet tall and 6 feet square. And they have a fine edge, as Gina was suggesting. And the people down at the quarry in North Carolina said, there's no way we can keep a straight edge on four corners as it comes right off the saw. But we said, yes, you can. And they did. And the stone setter said, there's no way you can set a 36-ton column one inch from another 36-ton column. But they did. And as the construction proceeded, all of the contractors just were so excited about the fact that they were building a Lewis Kahn design in the middle of, or in the early part of the 20th, 21st century, um, in the middle of Manhattan. And they definitely bought into the, the whole premise. So they all stepped up and delivered exactly what Lewis Kahn had specified. That's great. I'd like you to tell us more about what it took to make this happen. You, you came in 10 years, uh, I came 30 in years in, in into 06, the process. The end of 06. 30 years into the process. 35. 35? Well, yeah. well it, it was, yeah. it was, it was supposed to happen in, in the early 70s. So, okay. uh, and of course it didn't. It, it was very complicated because uh, Bill Vanderbilt asked me to join this little committee. I was on the board of the Roosevelt Institute. And he thought, let's see if we can get this going in this decade, having not been able to get it going in the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s. Um, so we just 
took it on. And Gina uh, oversaw the construction drawings, the, the final construction drawings, according to the con design. We had to get at least 20 different permits from federal, state, and local uh, agencies and departments. I mean, NOAA, OSHA, Army Corps of Engineers, everybody's building department. It was a very complicated, because you're building something in the middle of New York City on an island in the river. Um, I was working with the elected officials to a great extent. Bill was uh, a prodigious fundraiser because we had to raise 50 million and it was a, a recession. I mean, this is 07, 08 and 09 when we're raising the money. Um, so it was, nobody really thought it would happen, but we just kept going. And uh, there was lots of obstacles to overcome, perfectly understandable ones, but we just persevered. and. Uh, the actual construction took 30 months, which was on, on budge, under budget and on schedule so that we could open in the fall of 2012. Uh, but a lot of, it was a complicated uh, project because we had, it was a city-state private partnership. So the state and the city put up money and Bill promised that we would raise most of it privately, which we did, but they were wonderful partners. And then of course, Roosevelt Island Operating Corporation actually was in charge of running Roosevelt Island which is actually owned by the city and leased to the state, as you know very well. So there were complicated jurisdictions here and there. We needed a joint funding agreement. We needed a development agreement. That took about nine months to hammer out all of those agreements. And we were under the threat of time because we had $8 million pending from a philanthropist in Chicago with a deadline that if we didn't break ground by the end of March 2010, that $8 million would go away. We made the deadline. And we moved on from there and uh, were able to open in the fall of 2012 with great delight with President Clinton and Mayor Bloomberg and Governor Cuomo and Tom Brokaw and Ann Roosevelt. So, Congratulations. Yeah. It was a great job. Well, it's, it's a, a great real privilege, park. as you can imagine. It's yes. uh, not normal or not usual that a, a project that grand comes someone's way. So it's been a privilege. We've been talking with Sally Menard, who is the Vice Chair of the Four Freedoms Park Conservancy. I thank you viewers for tuning in to CB8 Speaks. See you next time. Thank you. That's really fun to talk to you it about the park. It, it was, was really, really fun. fun. <laughs>